So uh, I'll just very briefly uh, introduce uh, our, our keynote speaker, who is uh, Professor Samuel Moyen. Uh, I'm sure most of you already know Sam's work, but uh, just to sort of reiterate, he's, he's written widely uh, on the history of ideas in general, uh, and for our purposes, his uh, his historical accounts of the origins of human rights and contemporary debates around human rights have been uh, provocative and sort of, in some respects, um, trend-setting and, and sort of debate-setting. So we, we're here talking about temporality and time and so forth, and every dominant ideology obviously presents itself as the sort of closed circle of all that's possible. It's one of the things we've discussed at different times. And so for many of you, perhaps your first interaction with Sam's work would have been last utopia, uh, where he sort of burst the cosy bubble of liberal consensus about where human rights came from and what role they'd played uh, throughout the late 20th century. Uh, more recently, uh, Sam has published uh, a book called uh, Not Enough, which is about the place of human rights in the contemporary global order, uh, particularly with relation to the rise of material inequality. So I'm going to focus briefly uh, on, this, on this newest book and register some observations about it, and then Sam's going to get here and give the talk to you all came along to here. Uh, so first and foremost, not enough is, 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 if you haven't read it yet, it's a really important intervention uh, in this field. It, it picks up uh, a number of threads and a number of important debates in the, in the sort of ever-expanding literature about human rights and globalization. And it focuses in particular on the tension that Sam identifies between sufficiency as a moral idea and equality as a much grander uh, set of demands. And there are a number of key arguments, and I'm going to do my best to sum it up very briefly, but one of the essential points that Sam uh, makes in the book is that the contemporary era of human rights is really a second prize uh, that we've all gotten because of the defeat or the collapse of socialism, of ambitious national welfare states and so forth, and it's really only with the decline of these projects in Sam's account that we see human rights come to the fore. So human rights are like a compromise, uh, silver as a wooden spoon, uh, for having lost the uh, class struggle uh, against the Thatcherites and so forth. Uh, I, I think there's an awful lot uh, in this argument to recommend. I think Sam, uh, it's a beautifully written book and it also covers an important and really in, in sort of interesting historical range of examples. The discussion of the Jacobean state and the role which that played in articulating ideas of the role of the modern state in delivering equality and so forth is really interesting. The discussion of uh, FDR and the Second Bill of Rights, the discussion of the new international economic order, its promises and its failures are all really important. It actually relates to Catherine's idea of timeliness and time, you know, and, and sort of fits in with that. So I do, this is the nice part. I really, I really recommend Sam's book. I think it's excellent. Now, I have some reservations about it, um, which I've written about in a symposium on the Law and Political Economy blog about Sam's book. Uh, two or three key points that I'll, I'll say briefly, and then I'm sure Sam will sort of deal with them and more. The first one is the idea of the human rights movement. So Sam writes a critique of the human rights movement and the role that the human rights movement has played and continues to play in the contemporary global order. And I think this is a completely justified uh, and persuasive critique, but I think it applies to one section of what could be called the human rights movement. So I think when Tom talks about the human rights movement, he is, for the most part, talking about Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, large international human rights organizations, and so forth. And so I think his critique has less purchase when it comes to the actions of grassroots social movements, of uh, different groups around the global south, and so forth, who mobilize the language of rights in very complex and different ways. So I think it is an excellent and biting critique of this, what, Am what Ameline and his colleagues refer to as the human rights industry. I think it's a perfect critique of that group, but I think it has less purchase when we, when we sort of differentiate and disaggregate human rights actors. The second point then is about inequality. So Sam's book correctly uh, tracks picking up on all the scholarship in the field on the massive increase in material inequality over the last 30 years. Again, even Piketty, who is by no means you know, radical or a Marxist, he's a very good neo-Keynesian economist, even Piketty points out the structural character of capitalism and how it generates inequality in this way. Then he gets to the edge of the cliff, terrified, and runs back and says, maybe, maybe, maybe we should have a finance swap tax, but I don't know what else we can do, and sort of leaves it at that. So Sam picks up on this growth of inequality and, and stresses how this is the central factor that confronts us all today. Uh, and part of the reason 
in Sam's argument, why inequality has grown over the last 30 to 40 years, is that there was no political project placing meaningful constraints on the growth of this inequality. Uh, human rights was the best we had, and it was, in Sam's phrase, a sort of helpless companion in the face of this growing inequality, expansion of neoliberalism, and so forth. I agree with lots of this, but I think there's a tension in Sam's own book. I think the focus in Sam's book is about distribution and redistribution. And the talk is about we need states to intervene to have better policies that give a bit more to, to the poor and take a bit away from the rich. Now, I think this is a fundamental problem uh, of lots of accounts of inequality. Because again, and I don't have the time to spell it all out, it's about the origins of inequality in the system of capitalism. And of course, redistribution plays a part in that. Specific government policies are part of that. But again, it's the structural character of capitalism which generates inequality at the point of production, at the productive relationship where every worker produces more than they're ever paid, and this generates these tendencies. So I think that in Sam's book, he rightly identifies inequality as the issue, but doesn't quite get to the root causes of inequality. And so that's one of the, the points I'd flag up for Sam and for, for other people working uh, in this area. Finally then, and just briefly, I think Sam's book does two things with relation to human rights which are interesting. I think he gives human rights too much credit and not enough credit. Uh, so I think Sam very rightly says uh, human rights didn't cause neoliberalism. There are some sort of lazy critiques of rights out there which basically go, oh, rights have done this, rights have ruined everything and we need to get away from rights. And Sam gets away from that. At the same time, I'm going to find, it just so happens I have my notebook with my notes on Sam's book here. <laughs> that, was, that was fortunate. Uh, Sam makes the point, which I think is a bit overbroad of a claim. Uh, he says, human right, a human rights movement emerged in the 1970s and onwards, focused on sufficiency, uh, which reset the limits of optimism for what was possible uh, in what became to be the neoliberal age. So on the one hand, Sam correctly, I think, says, well, no, actually, human rights aren't the problem. But then I think he gives too much emphasis to what human rights, the causal relationship or the, the power that human rights have exerted in the neoliberal uh, era. And then I think he gives it not enough uh, credence, or doesn't, uh, doesn't give human rights enough scope by simply relegating it to the actions of human rights. Because again, the critique, as it applies to Human Rights Watch and so forth, is absolutely spot on. But I think the book doesn't pick up on the innovative and uh, radical ways in which different social movements around the world have, all throughout the neoliberal era, mobilized the language of human rights in ways that do challenge inequality, that do question the material relationships that produce inequality in the first place. So again, you, you all know who Sam is. His latest book is fantastic. I have some reservations around it, and now he'll talk to us. <laughs> Well, thanks to uh, Catherine and Mark, first of all, for organizing such a stellar conference. And thanks to Paul for those helpful uh, introductory remarks. Um, so, you know, when I was negotiating with Catherine, I said, I don't wor work on human rights and temporality. And for that matter, I'm semi-retired from human rights scholarship. And I, I'm a, I interpret her as saying, come and talk anyway. Uh, so what could I do? You know, uh, I, I've come up with some remarks about uh, human rights and progress in contemporary scholarship, and hopefully they'll provide a bridge to the discussion about human rights and neoliberalism that really has been constant all day and that Paul's just stressed now. So the talk will, you know, as informal and uh, as it is, we'll have three parts. First, I really want to uh, look at uh, what I'll call the great measurement debate, which has been the central controversy in human rights scholarship, uh, I would say, in the past decade, especially for Americans, but then for you know reasons of malign imperialism, what Americans are doing loom large uh, over, over lots of fields of inquiry. This has been uh, for many, uh, a passionate debate uh, in which there are two sides starkly arrayed against each other. And what I want to do in the first part of the talk is just to review it to show that um, actually the two sides agree uh, in their views um, and that they also concur in lacking what they most need, which is a theory of progress. Um, that's to say, improvement in time. So the contestants in the great measurement debate um, have been many, but the 
easily the two leading members of the, the, the rival teams are at the head of one, Beth Simmons, uh, an international relations scholar now at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who's written a, a, a actually magisterial book um, called Mobilizing for Human Rights. And on the other side, Eric Posner, a longtime professor uh, at the University of Chicago, like his father, the founder of, of libertarian law and economics. Uh, and he's written about international law in a, in a deflationary mode for some, really his whole career. But uh, uh, his, his second to last book, The Twilight of Human Rights Law, was intended uh, to write the epitaph of the field of, uh, uh, that in his title. And um, in particular, to argue that Simmons is mistaken, uh, and that those who promote human rights law as, a, as an approach to, to international justice should, should give it up and try something else. Um, what I want to suggest is that this debate is really focused on what Paul might have called the question of, was there jam yesterday? Um, has human rights law made a discernible contribution to human affairs so far? Uh, and that's what the debate's about. Neither draws or can draw, I'll show, any really explicit lessons about its, its utility today and in the future for you know, whether there's jam now or later. Um, so um, this whole debate is, you know, I think unusual for American, for non-Americans who aren't obsessed with so-called empiricism, uh, meaning uh, a certain kind of coding and counting uh, so as to prove in, it, it, to the satisfaction of social sciences, scientists that particular um, causal variables are, can be proven to have efficacy. In the human rights field, this debate got kicked off by a colleague of mine in her, in her youth uh, when she wrote a famous article, uh, Ona Hathaway, called Do Human Rights Treaties Make a Difference? And her tentative conclusion was that they do. They, they often make the world worse when, let's call them despots, take advantage of the reputational benefits of ratifying treaties uh, without then changing their behavior. Um, and this article uh, was extraordinarily controversial and launched a thousand ships in the relevant communities of those who think they can through data analysis and, uh, and, and various kinds of statistical techniques prove um, certain uh, facts about the, the recent past. Um, so, you know, this, this debate circles around um, you know, first of all, the nature of, of the information and its reliability. And we won't be able, with our skills, or at least mine, to inquire into this uh, domain. But, you know, this is one of the famous charts from the debate um, from, from Eric Posner, which essentially shows that um, torture has increased, um, sorry, torture has remained uh, the same the same incidents, even as ratifications of the Convention Against Torture have increased. Um, now, the other side accepts this finding, but says that once we're more sensitized to torture because we've ratified a treaty about it, we might look harder for it than we did before and therefore report more incidents. Um, and that we can still, let's say, seize optimism from the jaws of apparent in, uh, 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 ineffectiveness. Um, but leaving those issues aside, what I really want to do is look at how these two main standard bearers um, argue and um, how they turn out to essentially agree about the facts in spite of what you may have heard if you've had any um, relationship to this body of literature. First, it's, it's, it's just worth stating at the threshold that they are partisans of a particular American style of asking and answering questions about politics. And their, their methodology is identical. Um, they just disagree. They think about facts. Um, it's very interesting that even though Posner is, is a welfareist, you know, he he's, comes out of, um, you know, his, he comes by that honestly given his father, He's not at this stage willing to contest the fact that human rights as a set of norms are worthwhile. His problem, 
is that he thinks human rights law has made little to no difference. Meanwhile, uh, Beth Simmons, uh, for, for a number of reasons, has focused her career, and in particular this book, Mobilizing for Human Rights, also on the law, not the larger universe of, of human uh, rights norms or politics. After all, we might well conclude uh, that to date, uh, human rights law has had modest effects, but that says nothing about whether human rights norms or politics more broadly might have some worth uh, in the world today. And yet, this whole debate is not about that much broader question about our human rights culture. It's really about whether international treaties are a good thing. Europeans should be outraged by this debate because it is framed in terms of international treaties. These people know or at least say nothing about regional human rights systems. We can't deny, for example, that the European Convention uh, has had massive effects. Uh, and of course, that's why the Tories are upset about it. Um, and it seems as if we really wanted to prove that law was, gave us cause for hope about um, progress in time, we would look not at, or not exclusively at international treaty, but also at regional treaties, but they don't do this. Now, more interestingly, Simmons um, does find some hope in international law uh, of human rights, but it's mainly by foreclosing hope uh, in lots of places you might think you'd find it. Um, so many of us would think that the whole purpose of international law is to set up international monitoring or even, you know, for treaties, for states that ratify various optional protocols, um, complaints mechanisms. Uh, she argues that UN monitoring is essentially useless because the United Nations is a body of, by, and for the states, a massive, collusive organization uh, to exonerate, uh, in which states exonerate one another. Um, she's also caustic about um, transnational human rights mobilization. What she says, though, is that when a state ratifies a treaty, if there's a pre-existing domestic movement for justice, it can appeal to the fact that this ratification has occurred as an extra tool um, to press its, its claims. And she says, this is a plausible explanation for why human rights law has made the very modest difference that it that she's able to measure. Uh, and that's essentially her whole book. I've just, you know, if you haven't read it, no need to, because that's, that's what she says. Um, so the, what's, what's kind of interesting is how caustically skeptic she is about human rights law, except for in this one causal pathway through which she thinks she can say that there have been modest gains if domestic groups mobilizing um, in the right circumstances, because you have to have sort of enough democracy, but not too much for this effect to obtain, um, can, can appeal to the treaty. Now, I think what's most amazing about this debate is that Posner essentially concedes Simmons' point. Um, generally, he's taken in most of the you know, rumors about a big contest around human rights law to have argued that human rights law makes no difference. But in this crucial passage, he says, actually, I'll give Simmons the modest difference that she claims it's made. Uh, so it's, it's a surprising statement because it seems as if, if you read it, they're not actually disagreeing at all. Uh, Simmons claims through this one causal pathway, there's modest difference uh, in progress and time that human rights law allows. Posner agrees. Um, now, what I want to do is kind of, as an outsider to this debate and one who's quite unhappy about how the kind of space it takes up in especially American debate, to, to draw some conclusions about the fact that actually the two sides agree. But let's also note a couple of other ways that they agree to anticipate some later parts of our discussion. First, both sides more or less are solely measuring effects in the domain of political and civil rights. Second, they also concur um, in refusing any counterfactual speculation uh, about what other tools there might be, whether for pre-existing movements or one that might come online if we work hard on it. 
even if you take Simmons's case seriously, it's utterly dependent on pre-existing movements being around for them to take advantage of human rights law just as an extra tool in the toolbox. But then you might ask, isn't the really important thing where movements come from, how they get started, how they become more powerful, what other tools they have. But she is so intent on refuting Ona Hathaway's finding that human rights treaties are making no difference, the so-called null hypothesis, that she's focused on this very, in a way, minor problem, whether we can prove to a certainty that human rights treaties have improved the world at all. Now, it's true that Posner does acknowledge alternatives, and indeed he says we should just junk human rights law and m turn to something he calls development. And that's, I guess, come up in the conference. But it's extremely vague, uh, and, and it commits what people of his ilk might call the nirvana hypothesis, where you're very critical about something actually existing as if there's some easily available alternative. And so I think we can say that these two sides of this alleged debate are concurring not just in um, scanting any interest in distributional politics, including economic and social rights in the age of human rights treaties, but also in, in scanning any thinking about alternatives. So from this perspective, I think we should draw the following conclusion relevant to our conference from this non-debate. They agree about nearly everything. And the real puzzle is why one is so enthusiastic and the other scornful about the same facts. Uh, both see a, a glass half full, or maybe in fairness, less than half. It's not empty. Uh, there's a modest difference that human rights treaties can be proven to make so far. And yet, uh, Posner says we should ditch the glass and I guess Simmons thinks we should celebrate it as is. And that seems a very weird conclusion. It's weird that they think they differ, and it's weird that they um, are really arguing about you know, wh what to make of the fact that the glass has so little water. What I think has been missed in this debate, and this is gonna finish this first section and lead to the second, is that both um, you know, need a theory of progress for us to care about their findings. That's to say, um, a theory of what constitutes sufficient and sufficiently rapid moral improvement in time. I think Simmons implicitly thinks that she's proven that human rights are a big deal. But for that to be true, we would have to have grounds for being impressed that there's any water in the glass at all. Uh, and meanwhile, it's the same as true of Eric Posner. Uh, he's proven, well, he's agreed with Simmons that there's very little water, but he's not entitled to his conclusion that we should you know, throw the glass off the table. That would depend on knowing that we have something better available uh, or that we should just you know, stick with the, st or, or that we should, um, you know, not it, we should we should feel that this this uh, you know glass needs needs some kind of replacement. So um, I want now I want to move to a second set of human rights scholars. Um, these two don't disagree. Uh, they're actually colleagues and former colleagues of mine. Uh, they're in a mutual admiration society with one another, um, and that's very important. I think. Um, and they're relevant to us because one talks lots about human rights and, and the other is one of the leading human rights scholars of our time. I'm referring, of course, to Steven Pinker, who's had a major international bestseller this last year with his book Enlightenment Now, precisely on progress, and Catherine Sickink, uh, who you mentioned in, in your remarks, who has a book very significantly entitled for our conference, Evidence for Hope. Now, what I think distinguishes these two scholars from the prior two is that they both want to give us more intellectual reasons to believe that human rights are uplifting, that they provide grounds for optimism. I've suggested that what's, what's maybe so infuriating about the first two is that they're so focused on an alleged empirical dispute that they don't even recognize that what they really need is a theory of, of progress or grounds for hope and, 
in the particular kind and mode and amount of moral improvement that human rights provide. So to their credit, these two scholars, Pinker and Sicking, are, are gonna try to, to wrestle with what it would mean to provide hope, uh, and in particular to believe that human rights are a mechanism through which our hopes can be fulfilled. So they're interested in you know, whether the fact that jam is on the bread in the past, at least in this modest, you know, very thin layer, uh, might lead us to embrace human rights as jam for the present and future. So let me make a brief sidebar before I continue thinking about these two figures and, and, and just remind you that um, it's, it, from a Christian perspective out of which our whole culture came and out of which the theory of progress uh, in most of its versions came. It's actually very strange that we should be seeking evidence for hope about the future in the first place. Uh, this is Ireland. I hope it's still permitted to cite a couple of New Testament verses. Um, according to at least one Christian view back in the old days, um, we had hope in contrast to any available evidence. In fact, it seemed as if the visible evidence of the world should, would lead us to despair, but for our faith uh, in God's eventual redemption. Uh, so you see this verse in Romans 5. We boast in hope because of the glory of God. Uh, and in fact, we, we glory in, in evidence of, you know, that would ordinarily lead to a lack of hope because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, no human rights scholar could make this claim. You couldn't justify hope by showing that the world is the same or getting worse. Um, uh, and it seems as if our, our scholars are gonna recognize they're, that they're in a post-Christian moment where evidence is going, is going to matter. Um, and again, that's radically contrary to the old Christian view, um, which says we don't look out at the world to justify our hopes for the future. It's precisely things not seen uh, that, uh, uh, that matter. It's not the temporal, uh, but the eternal, in which we can merely believe that justifies our optimism. Now, as you probably also know, there were lots of other Christians, and I just want to mention this because I think it'll be relevant to the later discussion, who believe that actually even Christianity needs to take the evidence seriously and therefore the scene seriously. Um, the main reason was that Christianity kind of allied itself to the Roman Empire, and for a couple of centuries, things looked good because both were in the ascendancy. One, uh, the faith religion, and the other as a, a political empire. And you had figures like Eusebius say that the political success of Rome after the Constantine's conversion proved that Christianity was true. Uh, and this then forced others, notably after Rome fell, to think about what it meant that the evidence didn't always seem to justify uh, uh, our hope in, in the salvation that Christianity promised us. What else is Augustine's city of God but a reckoning with the fact that for, for Christian hope that Rome had fallen? There are great old histories of the origins of the modern theory of and demand for progress, and all of them concur that it has roots in the salvation religions and notably in Christianity. The main idea being that um, people needed to believe that God had a master plan and it wasn't just that God was unseen that, but that his will and plan were playing out through the historical process. Um, and this, this led them to think in I think some very curious ways. It led them to think that history's let's say all of a piece. Um, there aren't like lots of different tendencies in it, but there's one plan. And of course, this was going to have a major legacy for all of our modern social theory, uh, including in figures like uh, G.W.F. Hegel and Karl Marx himself. Um, and uh, 
Um, it may have been that the plan was hidden or confusing, but uh, the best analyst could somehow discern it. Now, I want to look at these figures and come back to those ideas later um, to um, think about how they struggle, I think nobly, to conclude that we can believe in progress. Well, Pinker, has anyone read a book, his book or reviews of it? Has it been as well publicized in the United Kingdom as everywhere else? No? Okay. Well, he's, he, it, it's, it, I, I promise you it's, it's, been, it's been a bestseller in, in many countries. It's, it's essentially a survey of the empirical information, not just about human rights um, outcomes, but about all kinds of outcomes from uh, wealth to poverty, health, uh, longevity. And then he faces the really difficult problem. Uh, that's the sort of thing on a much grander scale that Simmons had provided. Uh, but there's this question, what, what significance does it have? It could be taken to illustrate that there's so much you know, more that we could achieve if we shifted tax. Um, why should we get enthusiastic? Uh, if I started a diet, uh, you know, I might lose a pound next week, but I might get really depressed all the same. The fact that I've you know, made some progress might leave me you know, forlorn because I wanted something much better more quickly. Um, and he, unlike Simmons and Posner, he recognizes that he has to give some reason to get really excited that we're alive now. The principal thesis of his book is that if you're a critic of your times, you have not taken seriously how awesome uh, our civilization is, uh, and in particular in the neoliberal period. So he's very lucky he wasn't here for Paul's <laughs> earlier uh, remarks because he, he would have found some reason to complain. Um, so how does he proceed? Well, he says, look, we can all agree what would constitute progress. I mean, we just have such different worldviews. But let's all agree that some very basic goods are worthwhile. Um, things like, you know, whether you're alive to begin with. More people are now. Uh, health, people are healthier. It's a lot safer, at least corporal safety. Literacy, I mean, it's actually quite extraordinary uh, that he, sh he shows um, many, many, many more people can read than even 50 years ago, let alone 200. Sustenance and stimulation. Um, I think it's widely agreed, and we'll come back to this later, that um, although we can debate whether in terms of absolute numbers there are fewer poor today than ever before, as a relative number, there are certainly far, far fewer people below the extreme poverty line that the World Bank has established, and maybe the even higher poverty line. Um, and, you know, he says, it's not that those are all of your goals, uh, but they're big deals. And if we all agree about these very basic things, we should take the, our success in regards to these and as cause for saying we've progressed, like there's no question about it, uh, and for getting really excited about our times. I think he recognizes that this kind of argument isn't gonna be sufficient because he gives another one. And that first argument is, is very troubling because you know, back at the beginning of our philosophical position, tradition, you know, Aristotle says, well, does it matter whether you're living or living well? Well, really the latter. So then we really have to have the dispute um, about like, what the real ends are, the so-called transcendent values. There are lots of Christians who've seen their religion basically crater in a you know, place like this across Europe that who might say, well, it's true that lots of people are alive, but people have lost their belief in the Savior uh, in the same period, and we should get really depressed about that fact. What does it matter if so many more people are, are living bourgeois lives if they've lost their orientation to the divine and so forth and so on? So he recognizes this and says, well, there is one good that's of, of a kind of 
you know, more transcendent than just staying alive and learning how to read and so forth, which are all really important, obviously. And it's the ability to make choices. So the, his idea here, and he cites Amartya Sen, is that we shouldn't think we, we could ever agree about a good and we wouldn't want to impose a transcendent value on anyone. But we can celebrate that people get to choose their own scheme of life. And on that metric too, he thinks people not only get to do so in much larger numbers than ever before in history, but they're happy about the freedom they enjoy. So on, on these two grounds, um, you know, he, he says ours is an age of progress. Now, I, I, I think that there's big problems with this approach. Um, he has a chapter on human rights, by the way, so check it out if you're in our field. Um, one is that, you know, I think he overstates the degree to which we can rely on such facts um, as auth authorizing or warranting our optimism. This is a, a worry that goes back to Immanuel Kant and our philosophical tradition. Um, uh, like many of those Christians I mentioned who believed like Kant that there, there's hopefully a master plan working itself out behind our backs. Um, uh, Kant believed that facts were relevant and we needed to look out at the world to, to justify um, our optimism that there's moral improvement over time. But in the end, we need to take a leap of faith about it. Um, for one thing, and this I think applies directly to Pinker too, it could be that we prove that we've, we're doing so much better according to any set of criteria, uh, but that doesn't prove it will keep going. No amount of data dumping uh, as, uh, that Pinker provides amounts to a philosophy of history in the sense that it justifies any investment in the continuation tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. And so if we're people who want to take the leap from empirical progress to belief in future progress, we need to you know, rely on something other than facts about the world, acquired gains. Now it's at this moment, and I don't think people have gotten too far beyond him in this regard, that Kant said we do just have to develop a kind of you know, rational faith commitment uh, in, and, and if we want to be hopeful people, it's going to involve some kind of um, leap. Um, he did say we could rely not just on past facts, but present facts that had a particular status. And he, if you've read this essay of his, an old question asked again, is the human race constantly progressing? He kind of reinvents the old Jewish theory of prophecy he says there are particular kinds of events, uh, he cites the French Revolution, which are special. They're signs uh, like the old you know, idea from the New Testament. They have, they're special in character because they look backwards. Um, that's the signum rememorativum part. They, they situate and orient us in the present by, by demonstrating that progress is, is possible, or at least leading us to, to have some warranted faith that it is. That's the demonstrativum part. And they, they justify us in, in believing or hoping that a, a better future will come about. That's the prognosticon part. Um, if you don't like this theory, if you don't like the theory that even the most secular person to have a kind of hopeful orientation in the midst of, of it all, um, must have some kind of rational faith commitment, then it, I think the, the burden is very heavy on you to figure out you know, what other approach could you have. Of course, like Paul, you could say there hasn't been progress. Um, it, that's how I interpreted uh, your, your earlier remarks that we're, we're in the midst of capitalist and, and, and within capitalist neoliberal horror um, and, and things are getting worse. That view doesn't really square with the facts as Pinker reports them, um, but I do want to still give a criticism of, of Pinker. Let's move on um, first to Catherine Sicking, who I think is, is maybe a bit more subtle in this respect. Um, she's not 
trying to prove to us that we should believe we're living in the best time alive. She's not trying to prove to us that all, along all dimensions, the world is, is a much better place than ever. She just wants to prove that against people like Stephen Hopgood and Samuel Moyne, we shouldn't you know, trash the Human Rights Project. Fortunately, I've never said we should, but she thinks I did. Um, so she writes a whole book called Evidence for Hope. It's like a, it's a, that's a you know, profoundly Christian title. Um, and she says, I can't promise you that human rights will make the world a better place, but we have to leave room based on the past that this fledgling activity by the few ragtag moralists we have left in the world will redeem us, or at least give us a, bi a bit more improvement um, from here. So she endorses this idea she gets from the old economist Albert Hirschman called possibilism. Um, now, what I'm concerned about is that she says that um, people who hope too much, who hold out for a bigger and better version of hope, um, are likely to, um, you know, lead us to leave behind the sources of hope we already have, like the Human Rights Project as it stands, um, and, and force people into an attitude of complacency or indifference. She says, by focusing exclusively on the gap between our ideals and our practice, um, we've tipped the balance towards pessimism and despair. And so we need a kind of very modest um, approach to human rights that celebrates it for, it, it for its modest improvement. Don't ask for more, because the likely outcome is that you'll just depress all the students. Um, now this is like Simmons's project, but again, nobly, Catherine takes on the burden of explaining why, why she thinks we should be hopeful, and in particular of rebutting those of us who have said not that human rights is a bad thing, but we, we need something much better. Um, and it's this argument, that asking for more than we've got, either from human rights or outside human rights, is counterproductive. So, um, you know, let me conclude this section by saying that uh, this, this is, I think, a, an interesting debate. And if you don't like their positions, I think you have to think about what you would say, even if you think there is some available project that we could outline with some specificity, like Marxist revolution or whatever we still have to explain why that offers grounds for optimism um, and not you know, a recipe for disaster. So they're, they're trying to, these scholars are trying to kind of face the challenge of justifying hope and that's, as I've said, a noble thing. Just in passing, because it, I think her argument in this regard is very bad, let me just note that it's not obvious that pointing out the distance between you know, a much more just world and the little bit that human rights has done for us is necessarily a, 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 a has the outcome of inaction and depression. It could have the reverse uh, uh, consequence. It could lead students and whomever else is listening to say, well, we need to build something much better. We need to face the fact that human rights have been such a modest contribution, not in order to go into banking, uh, but in order to, you know, figure out what the right ambitious moral project is. And it's not obvious to me in advance that we can decide which of these um, hypotheses about um, um, where you're going to get commitment and action um, comes from. The real criticism I want to make of, of both of these figures is that they're, they've, they haven't um, transcended, but then I think neither did Marxism, at least in most of its versions, um, this, this old Christian legacy to which I alluded, which is that history is all of a piece. There's either progress or not. Uh, uh, now, people who adopt this view can disagree about its sources, about how hidden it is, um, how, what the signs are of the a plan unfolding, but they all agree um, that in present or future, there's a plan that can be activated. Um, you know, in Marx's version, history works 
behind the acts of men, and at least in many interpretations that, to which Paul alluded earlier, it's bringing an inevitable revolutionary outcome. Um, it's for that reason that Marx at least thought bourgeois justice was incredibly progressive. You know, it was a huge breakthrough for human progress. It's just that it was digging its own grave for the sake of an even brighter future. Um, but we can tell that both Pinker and Sickink are indentured to this view in, in a different version. So there are two key chapters in Pinker's book, one's about the environment and one's about inequality, in which he basically says, don't believe that these are flies in the ointment. Um, envi the environment is, is dying, but we'll fix it. You know, the, it's, it, we shouldn't get depressed that the environment is dying because we have an easy technical fix. And he says inequality, um, while it is increasing nationally, is decreasing globally. And I think you know, we could have an empirical debate. Um, Branko Milanovic, on whom we all rely, thinks that we should celebrate the fact that we're living in a less unequal world thanks to so-called neoliberalism. Pinker acknowledges that there's much more national inequality in most places. He just says it's morally insignificant. What matters is poverty. Okay, so I've taken up way too much time, but I, I, I would like to conclude by getting into some of Paul's um, criticisms. Um, my work lately has been a, about uh, how human rights is not bad, it's that it's made modest contributions, and in particular, insofar as it's been distributively oriented, finally, uh, because even these mainline human rights organizations uh, that Paul mentioned have, have turned to distributional fairness. It's really been focused solely on what I call sufficient provision. Economic and social rights are generally, there may be some exceptions we can locate on paper or in different mobilizations, sufficiency demands. They're about giving everyone a good enough um, version of um, each of the good things in life. Um, uh, meanwhile, egalitarian Ideals and practices have died in the age of human rights. So the charts I like to show are the engram on the left, which shows that you know for most of the 20th century, socialism was very popular. Uh, and then it began to tank just as human rights, hitherto unpopular, began to ascend. The lines cross in 1989. And the worry is not that human rights are bad or make no difference, but that, that, that we, we've lost one thing, egalitarianism, and gotten at best um, something that, that wants to make a modest difference with respect to sufficient provision. And of course, this does coincide with something that unlike Pinker and like Paul, I wanna claim as a great moral evil, namely the skyrocketing of inequality. This is the chart on the Gini coefficient in the United Kingdom since the 1960s. And basically the era of human rights um, on the first chart is the era of the victory of the rich on the second part. Uh, and I want to say this is bad and we should supplement the great but modest project of human rights with something um, alongside it that's um, differently ambitious but egalitarian in its aspirations. So that gets to Paul's blog post and I basically agree, I think we largely agree. I think there'd be some definitional dispute over what counts as a human rights movement I think we probably would diverge more about when we look hard, how many actually have advocated distributive equality um, rather than just said they did and said they did five minutes ago. Um, I think the number is tiny to non-existent and maybe it's more than I, I, I thought. Um, if we do say that human rights activism has been egalitarian in its aims, I think it would be embarrassing because the evidence shows that the outcomes are going the other way. I would like to exonerate human rights, uh, certainly on paper, but even in action from trying to create an equal world because to the extent they're trying, they're failing badly. Uh, the other side's winning. Then we'd get into some much bigger concerns, but I'll stop because we only have a few more minutes. Um, I don't provide a theory of neoliberalism in this book because I don't have one and I haven't seen one from Marxism that I think is, is, is satisfactory as a matter of consensus. 
Um, my only claim is that descriptively, human rights um, have surged in the era of the general abandonment of egalitarian concern. And that human rights, unlike socialism, can fit in a neoliberal ecology for, for the reason that it's not egalitarian. Uh, so if you like human rights and neoliberalism, whatever else we say about their deep causation, coexist because they're working on different things. Human rights on a floor of sufficient provision and, in, and neoliberalism on obliterating any ceiling on inequality. Now maybe to explain that, we ultimately do need a, a theory of neoliberalism. Maybe Marxism is it, but I, I just want to say that unlike those who say that human rights has been trying to deal with inequality, I haven't tried to provide a theory of neoliberalism. So that's a limitation of the book uh, only if that's a requirement. So I'll stop there. Um, the, my main idea has been that uh, you know, human rights is at the center of our current debates about um, moral progress and how we believe that we and human rights are part of it. And um, we should adopt a view that doesn't think there's one progress, uh, there's no one arc of the moral universe, as my president used to say. Uh, there are lots of things going on. And we do need to make sense of the fact that human rights have become our cause and made a modest difference, even as a lot's gone wrong. Thanks.